Welcome to HC Nation Tech Feed Edition, your guide to the best in HC content, the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is, high, low, in between, we're going to help you. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, and I'm Robert Heron. we got some great stuff coming up in today's show, including how to set up, how to configure, how to calibrate your very own Blu-ray player. But first, we got a question. Ahmad Khan comments on YouTube, how much should one spend on getting their television professionally calibrated? Ooh. You, sir, are a professional calibrator holding multiple certificates. Uh, like. You, THX, THX, ISF, uh, a few others too. I may add, and all good things to look for. Home when you're theater, shopping audio, and video for a I home don't. theater calibrator or an HCTV <laughs> calibrator. Totally. What should a mod? What should anybody be paying for a HC, for an HDTV calibration? Well, I'd say that prices do vary depending on who you go with and the services you're going to need. A hundred bucks would be a fair fee for a basic calibration. That includes verifying that everything is connected and cr uh, configured properly. Also. If you're looking at doing a full grayscale calibration and a color check for a single input, that's going to move you up into close to $300 range. Now, when you start adding in things like 3D calibration, that's going to add to the cost as well because it's usually more involved than a 2D calibration. You actually have to mm -hmm. calibrate through those awful pairs of glasses. Also, some display types are more challenging to calibrate than others. Polishing a turd can take much longer than massaging <laughs> a display that's already in the ballpark. Point blank simple. I, I much prefer working on the TVs that are pretty well set up from the factory and provide the controls I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Now, any good calibrator, though, is going to provide references that you should check out and make sure that who you're hiring is actually providing the service, not only that you need, right. but they're doing a good job as well. There's a reason we tell you about things like the Spears and Munsell disc and how to use those to configure your HCTV yourself because you may not have the budget to have your HCTV professionally calibrated. We have heard good reports from the field, from the calibrators that are available through Best Buy and other chains. Um, take that for what you will. You should always make sure there are references, people that will give you a call to say, hey, this guy says he, he tuned up your HCTV, what'd you think? And if somebody tells you, he ruined it. Well, that's a good sign that maybe <laughs> you might want to look for another calibrator. Totally. And you can also visit websites like THX, mm -hmm. ISF, or the Imaging Science Foundation, yeah. as well as companies like Cedia, or Cedia.net, and they will actually provide search engines where you can look for calibrators in your area that they recommend, and that's always a good way to go as well. And AVS, I always love AVS forums. Uh, that too. Actually, a lot of calibrators hang out in there mm -hmm. to talk about jobs they've worked on recently, and you can immediately pick up on who's 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 who in the industry, as well as what kind of work they're doing out there in the field. It's a good and thing. it is, and it's also a great resource too for lots of good stuff. Now, part of our mandate to the HD Nation is to help everyone get the most out of the gear that you already own. And today we're talking Blu-ray player setup. Uh, what are the settings that basically produce optimal picture output? Let's take a look. And we're going to demonstrate this on basically a Panasonic DMP BD230 connected to our Sony set here on, on, the, on the set itself. <laughs> and Sony uh, set set. <laughs> that too. And let's just dive right into it. Now, first off, the best way you're going to connect a Blu-ray player to a new HDTV is with HDMI, right. the high definition multimedia interface. Cables are cheap. Keep one handy. That's all I'm going to say about that. We, we know you've never connected a Blu-ray player to your HDTV via S-Video, but you've corrected in calibrations. You've basically taken a, you know HDMI, HD equipment. The and composite taken, cable. Yeah, and taken that off and plugged in a proper component output or HDMI yeah. output. I haven't seen too many players that include an H, uh, HDMI cable in the box, right. so if, if it was set up and connected with the cables that came in the box, it's that's probably a great place to start. Also. Doesn't matter where you buy your HD HDMI cables from, could be Amazon, Monoprice, your local computer store. Rule of thumb, don't spend more than two bucks a foot. Mm -hmm. And also, HDMI is backward compatible with DVI. So if you have an older HDTV or a projector that only offers DVI input, uh, those HDMI DVI adapters are cheap. Keep in mind, though, DVI is video only. You'll have to deal with audio separately when making yeah. that particular type of connection. Component video. Now, older HDTVs that lack like HDMI are the only candidates I'm going to recommend for that analog HD connector. And again, you're also dealing with audio as a separate connection. Now, when we talk about these alternate audio connections for your Blu-ray player, typically on the back you'll find an optical or coaxial stereo out. That's a digital output. Usually enabled SPDIF. SPDIF, too. Yeah. And also, you also have sometimes just stereo RCA jacks. Or even on newer players now, you'll see dual HDMI outputs. One of them being uh, provided a dedicated audio output mm -hmm. to an AVR. Now, there also may be related settings that turn off HDMI audio in your Blu-ray player for when you're connecting it to a TV and you're using that, say, optical or coaxial or RCA connection to something like an older AVR. 
just know that you will have to set that up. Totally. If, you, if your ATTV or your projector does not support HDMI, or if it has HDMI, worse yet, doesn't support HDCP, you're going to have to deal with some trauma, and there's no way around that. Totally. Yeah. Now, as far as setup goes, let's start simple. Start fresh. Either, one, reset the player back to factory defaults. Actually, you should do that no matter what. <laughs> if you're uncertain as to the status of the player, reset it, yeah. update its firmware, and use the guided setup tool. It's really all that most of us will need to do. And in this one, they actually have under system, let me think down here, Panasonic calls their simple setup easy, easy settings. And with that, it simply goes through what language? The resolution of the screen, or the, actually the aspect ratio of the screen itself. If you're using a 16 by 9 widescreen television, stick with 16 by 9. Don't do 16 by 9 full. That will actually distort your 4x3 videos if you're watching older Blu-ray or older DVDs yeah. in particular. Everyone will uh, look wide because yep. they're stretching the, the frame out. To <laughs> the Oompa Loompa nine. effect. Yeah. If there's a quick start feature, I tend to leave that off because it will consume a little extra power when the unit's powered down. But Turn it, it on. Yeah, <laughs> it does make life a little easier. And look at that, done. Also, you want to verify that a Blu-ray player is doing the correct thing with color and detail. And that usually will require some test material, like, hey, that Spears & Munsell HD Benchmark Calibration Disc 2nd Edition now features a color conversion test that will show if the player is doing the right thing or not. I do love that benchmark tool, but it is a bit much for most folks. <laughs> uh, really, that auto setting I just showed you is a great place to start. Now, when we get into color settings, you have things like color space settings. Auto, again, is usually where you want to go, but if you want to get into where the actual Let's see what it is here. Picture mode? I no. think it'd be under HDMI. Here we go. On this particular player, it actually defaults to something called YCBCR444. Uh, generally speaking, that's where it should be. Uh, that's a great place to start. Another compatible one would be YCBCR422. And there's also RGB modes as well. What's the difference between these? We're looking at basically component video are the first two options. The YCBCR mm -hmm. indicates component. And then the four numbers or the three numbers in a row indicate how much the color is being compressed. Now, as it's stored on the disc, it is highly compressed mm -hmm. in order to save space. However, the hardware in the player will convert that back up to 422. And then it has to convert it to 444. And then finally to RGB for the display. Now, the display can do this. Uh, the player could do it. Generally speaking, I say if you're going from HDMI device to HDMI device, stick with YCDCR444 mm -hmm. because that's, uh, it's not taking it all the way to RGB. It lets the TV handle that final conversion, but it's doing stuff that it should be able to mathematically do precisely and okay. give you proper color output. Is there a case if you have an older HDTV or maybe an HDTV with sort of you know, compression or color issues, should you allow that? Should you set up your Blu-ray player to output RGB instead of... That's a terrific question, and that's where you would need some kind of test material to show that off. And like I said, there are specific tests on here that you can look at to figure out which of the modes is better than the others, or which device is doing that color conversion properly or not. But you're going to need something like this in order to really make that assessment. A lot of cases you have the option of having the HTTV automatically sort of set everything or keep the native format. What do you recommend, automatic or manually configuring everything? Oh, uh, do auto first. Uh, mm -hmm. Auto is your friend, without a doubt, <laughs> be it audio or video output options. Auto usually gets it right. When you talk about things like 24p mode, if you have an auto mode for that, which in this case I think it's just on or off on this player, auto is usually the good way to go, but for 24p, if you have a newer TV and you want to experiment with that, go ahead and turn it on and see if you can. That's where you're getting into some of the TV settings though, that will influence whether or not how that works. Mm -hmm. However, if I did turn on, say, 24p mode on this and the TV didn't support it, it's okay because the player will still output the correct format and keep the picture going the way it should. Also, you're going to have things like picture adjustment modes and picture modes in general for your HDTVs. Leave them all set to standard normal, uh, whatever the default is for those to avoid introducing some non-standard enhancements to the picture. Some players will only expose those picture settings during playback, but again, leave it at default. If you want to calibrate the TV's picture output, <laughs> calibrate the TV, not the player. Also, 3D. Some 3D Blu-ray players, like the PlayStation 3, actually feature a 3D setup option that factors in the size of the TV you're looking oh, cool. at. Uh, verify that that size is correctly detected or just enter it manually yourself if it's not. And the bottom line, when you're uncertain, go auto. Use <laughs> HDMI cables, and if you want to improve picture quality, calibrate the HDTV set, because odds are the default settings from your Blu-ray player, especially with Blu-ray mm -hmm. movies, is going to be pretty spot on. So. Calibrate the HDTV first or the Blu-ray player first? Uh, 
you get your player straight, but you're going to need your TV calibrated at some point. And, right. and if you can't afford a calibration person to come in and take care of that for you, try using that movie yeah. or cinema mode on the TV. Don't use that movie or cinema mode that's built into the player. I was going to say, be careful, because <laughs> I've seen people like have a lot of squirrely settings inside of a Blu-ray oh. player, run their calibration, and the, end up with just really strange stuff on oh. the HD TV. Totally, totally. I think by far the best Blu-ray out the week of July 15th, 2013, is 42, the biopic about Jackie Robinson. You should know him as the first baseball player to break Major League Baseball's color barrier that segregated the sport for more than 50 years, to quote JackieRobinson.com. An extraordinary man, extraordinary story, and by most accounts, a most excellent Blu-ray. By the way, if you see a pile of mastered in 4K Blu-ray discs on the shelves this week, say Men in Black, Moneyball, Pineapple Express, Spider-Man 2, or the ever-so-awkward 1998 Godzilla, they ain't 4K. They're new 1080p Blu-rays encoded from 4K masters with pretty much no extras to maximize the space on the disc for the film and thus maximize the bit rate the movie is encoded at. Seeing now is a review from back in May, or what you just saw was Sound Division back in May uh, reported Spider Man was encoded at a consistent 35 megabits per second. That is a big deal nice. for a Blu ray. Sound Division said the picture had a more solid look with finer rendition of film grain. Sony's 2012 Spider Man BD releases no dog, but the texture of the grain was rougher and the image was overall more noisy compared to the mastered in 4K version. Also, says Sound Division, details like the strands of a spider web in a scene at a lab came across more clearly by a mastered in 4K. This is interesting stuff and something you should see. Uh, it's kind of funny because the, the actual resolution, the detail, the, you know, kind of like the, the increased detail in there is something you're going to see even if you don't have the chain of hardware you need to get Sony's expanded color, uh, which is also known as XV color or X. VYCC, which is something else that's showing up in the mastered in 4K discs. I'm going to have to get one of their TVs in, I think, and, and one of the compatible Blu-ray players. You have a PS3, you have a compatible yes. Blu-ray player for expanded color. Nice. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. It is not 4K, but it's the idea that for, you know, it. I'm, I'm kind of excited because do you remember Studios. super bit DVDs? Oh my goodness. That, see, this is similar to that. It's like, <laughs> get rid of all the crud, just movie only at, right. the, at the highest bit rate possible so you can have the maximum detail, especially with action movies. I think that's where you're really going to see the most improvements. If you're going to be heartbroken about not having like 72 additional sort of documentary features of the movie, you're not going to like Mastered in 4K because they're stripping all Got that it. out and using the entire Blu-ray for the movie. Good point. It's funny, not a lot of news this week, uh, but the internet blew up this morning talking about Apple's new ad skipping technology. Technology. This was awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, so Jessica Lesson, I believe just left the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she broke the story on JessicaLesson.com. She basically calls it, she's a little more accurate, she calls it technology that allows viewers to skip commercials and that pays media companies for the skipped views. Not a lot other than that is known other than that Apple's been pitching cable companies and TV networks. It could be a really interesting way for Apple to add premium live content to Apple TV. I, I think it really it's more interesting that while most HDTV manufacturers can't seem to make money on HDTVs, <laughs> JVC just launched a new line, a, basically a new flagship line of black Sapphire SL series HDTVs built by Vizio's maker, Amtran actually, and Gadget reports that, quote, the new models boast high-end touches like shiny bezels, ultra-thin profiles, and an edge-lit LED adaptive backlight system, and that L, uh, JVC is launching the lineup with their 799 42-inch model and 899 47-inch model. Interesting. Yeah. And it prices that aren't they are doing lines with some of the better values. Period. Exactly. Well, it's kind of funny. Usually they, they start out with the top of the line, 74 inch, $92,000 HCTV, and they're like, eh, we're starting at 800 bucks. That is a really different way of doing things, and you know, best of luck to JVC because we want to see them keep making amazing high end projectors, oh, or better yes. yet, figure out how to take that technology <laughs> from their high end projectors and make it more affordable. Love JVC's projectors. Dieter Alp commented on YouTube I never hear you guys talk about Bose systems. Why? Well, look, first up, our condolences to the friends and family of Amar Bose, the legendary MIT professor and audio entrepreneur who died a few days ago at the age of 83. Whether you love the Bose sound or hate it, the man had a major impact on the consumer electronics industry and generations of students at MIT. But in the words of Steve Gutenberg over at CNET, who wrote a thoughtful obit for Mr. Bose, quote, the Bose sound is loved by millions, but I can't say I've been all that impressed by too many Bose products over the last few decades. There was one exception, the Bose Quiet Comfort 15 noise-canceling headphones. They are by far the quietest headphone I have ever tested. 
Yeah, I mean, look, a major reason you won't find us talking up the gear that Bose has is because Bose is not interested in having their equipment reviewed by anybody that might suggest it's worth less than the sticker price or that you might be able to get more performance for less money. And given that the privately held company had revenues over $2 billion as recently as 2011, why would they? Um, look, if you like Bose, if you find it aesthetically pleasing, if you trust the brand, if you like the sound, go for it. You will almost never hear us recommending a Bose product over other products because we can almost always find something that sounds as good or better for less money. Bose is kind of... It's a it's good a place to start. Sound. It's a good place to start. <laughs> if you enjoy it, don't change it. There but you if go. you want the sort of more most accurate audio fidelity, I think there are other places to go. Cue the emails, hdnation at revision3.com. Tell us we're jerks. Hey, and the most popular noise-canceling headphone I see on any yeah. airline is theirs. Yeah, and they're, 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 Bose is hugely popular because people like the way it sounds because it's usually a huge step up from what they're used to, and that's a good thing. Anything that improves the sound quality is good. We think we can do better. <laughs> We're going to try at least. Hey, Richard yeah. A. posts on YouTube, hey guys, I want to know if there's a significant difference between Dolby True HD and DTS HD Master Audio on Blu-ray. I feel that the DTS track has more impact according to my ears, especially when it comes to machine gun fire. <laughs> my Bowers and Wilkins speakers have been tuned thanks to the Odyssey tech on my Denon AVR. Do you guys disagree? And lastly, will a second subwoofer in the back even out the bass in the room? Thanks, and you guys continue to rock every Wednesday. That's pretty cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, let's go in backwards order. Adding a second subwoofer can help smooth out the room, but you should make sure your current subwoofer is placed optimally first, especially if you have a small room. Because tuning two subs in a room is a little more complicated. Question, have you done the subwoofer crawl? It's really easy. You put the subwoofer in the prime viewing seat in place of it or in front of it. If it's a couch, you don't want to move it. And then you basically you start a bass heavy track or loop a particular scene you like from a movie. And you start crawling around the room. Crawl, hands and knees. Don't walk unless, of course, you're going to be mounting your sub at head level, in which case walk around the room. The spot that delivers the deepest, smoothest bass, not the boomiest, not the harshest, not the softest, not necessarily the loudest, that's where you should locate the subwoofer. This alone can make a huge difference by proper Properly placing the subwoofer, you can make a huge difference and really complement the room or just take advantage or minimize the impact of the room on the subwoofer. Just pray the optimal location for the subwoofer isn't, say, exactly where the coffee table is sitting right now. Because I've been in rooms like that where it's like, I found the perfect location. All we have to do is get rid of the bookshelves and the chair in front of them. And you Aww. get the stone-faced look from the other person <laughs> in the house. There is a great thread up on AVS forum talking about adding a second sub, doing the crawl to set up the subs, Odyssey's advice on subs and setting them up, and quite a bit more. Uh, AVS forum, we'll put a link in the show notes. It is really worth the read. Yeah, I want to show also how you can use certain sound uh, test patterns, uh, basically. Mm. Uh, pink noise or white noise, I think it's pink actually, at a certain frequency and you leave that running in the room and you will then be able to hear the null points in the room in terms of where the sound suddenly drops off. And they usually form in the areas of standing waves and those tend to be the places where if you're gonna start, where in the room should I put the sub? Well, you should put it right where those standing waves are or where the null points are to help flatten that out and to help even out the room. But that's a fun test I'm going to have to show how we're, to do. We're going to need to field shoot this in one of the other. Yep. No, we can't really do it in the studio. We can definitely do it in the field. Now I'm going to put blindfolds on people and tell them wander. Well, I'll get to carefully wander around the room. <laughs> Funk. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Empty Glass room. coffee table. Dolby True HD versus DTS HD. My opinion has always been more often than not, your movie is encoded in one or the other, and you live with it. You have a, a more firm opinion about what's going on, especially with gaming. Yeah, I would like to see lossless audio come to gaming, period. But mm -hmm. at least with some of the new games I'm seeing, they're offering DTS and Dolby on the same title, where you can select back and forth. Now, it's not the lossless version, uh, DTS HD Master Audio or Dolby True HD. But that's kind of nice that they at least provide both mm -hmm. on there. When you talk about the lossless track, so you're talking about so much more data, although it's still relatively small compared to the video, it would be nice if they just simply put both on there and allow you to go back and forth and do, a, do an AV comparison or AB comparison, but that would also add to the cost of the video production too right. in terms of getting the disc out the door. So in, in a lot of cases, one of the reasons DTS has found a lot of success on Blu-ray is because it's a less expensive option to Dolby or was in the early days of Blu-ray. Do you feel that one is, is more sonically advanced or superior to I'm, the other? I'm happy whenever the movie comes on and that <laughs> lights up and I know I'm getting, well, I see that I'm getting lossless audio from either source. To my ear, they both sound damn good. Uh, I really don't have a preference for one or the other. It's just that finally getting hardware that supports decoding of those tracks, it, it, it makes as much of a difference to me in my, my movie watching experience as it does having a calibrated TV or, or a big screen TV, a widescreen TV as well. R Roger, am I hearing something through the wall coming from the control room? <laughs> Any thoughts here? Bueller? 
I could have sworn I heard something. Silence. I'll take that as agreement. <laughs> Poppy Show comments. So would you guys recommend uh, the Vizio you showed on 7-8-2013 for gaming? Or if not, which would you recommend? Could you guys do a video on the best TVs for gaming, 50 inches or larger? Thanks. And BKO Batista adds, any tips for good 1080p monitors with low latency and a decent price would help too. Best HDTVs for gaming. Yeah. Uh, well, anything that... That particular Vizio we showed you had a good low latency when it came to its game mode and its performance with your traditional game consoles. Over at CNET, they have a ter terrific write-up right now about some of the best TVs they recommend that they've been testing a lot of different TVs. And I'm surprised at how many Sonys are appearing in the list there in terms of their game modes and providing... PS3, sub television's good for gaming. Sony S might have something to gain there. I'm thinking. <laughs> also some other brands too, but Sony's, they had a couple of Sony's that had sub 20 millisecond delays, and that's excellent. They consider basically anything under, under 30, no, under 40 would be considered very good. Anything above 70, they consider pretty bad, and so would I, basically. That's, that's where you're getting into uh, at least a few frames of delay yeah. between when you make a move and when it actually would appear on screen, so... That's one thing to consider right there. We'll put a link to that uh, list of monitors in the show notes. Uh, and I, I have a mea culpa, a correction. Uh, a B-Man third points out, at Patrick Norton on HD Nation, you said Gene Wilder was in the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It was Willy Wonka uh. and the Chocolate Factory. You are goddamn right, Birdman. <laughs> uh, and let me, I apologize. I just finished reading the magnificent Roald Dahl novel, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with my son Seamus, and mistakenly called the 1971 film by that name. Uh, that was actually the title of the 2000 film starring Johnny Depp, Mia Culpa, and my apologies to cinema enthusiasts everywhere. <laughs> I, and I got to say, I, I'm still a big fan of the Gene Wilder version Heck over, yeah. the, over the, the Johnny Depp version. I love Johnny Depp, but I don't think that one was entirely true to the book or the spirit of the thing. Ah, uh, Augustus Gloop. I should watch it again, though, just for fun. Speaking of fun, that's it for this episode of AC Nation Tech Feed Edition. Please subscribe to Tech Feed to get our show on your YouTube lineup or go to revision3.com slash HDNation. You can subscribe to our RSS feed to download, watch it on any piece of hardware in your house, I bet, and tell us what you think. Hey, that's right. And please post any comments, questions, or suggestions right down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.